Well, hello, and welcome to Pastor's Q&A. Today, I will be answering the following question. Should a Christian be conservative or progressive? Uh, now, this is an important question for the Christian to ask and answer. Why? Because these terms, conservative and, prog and progressive, have become so politicized that there are many who would identify as conservative or progressive and not even know what those words mean, not even really know what is being defined by those terms. Uh, our psychosocial need to belong produces an impulse to claim group identity with somebody, oftentimes without even thinking. And so what often happens is that we intuitively feel better with a certain group for a variety of reasons, and so we claim some form of allegiance to that group and their ideology without having done the homework necessary to know whether or not this is a good association. People can, as a result of this, sometimes agree uh, to certain public policy ideas, certain ideas about morality and what ought to add to and lead to a flourishing society uh, just because their team says so, without actually coming to any rational conclusions, or without coming, rather, to any conclusions rationally. We just follow the crowd, so to speak. Now, this is not a wise lifestyle uh, choice for anybody, but for the Christian who is beholden to Christ and a biblical worldview, it is an utterly untenable modus operandi. Uh, a disciple of Jesus must take every thought captive to obey Christ. So, Let's now consider the terms conservative and progressive. What do these terms actually mean? To be conservative means that you believe that society is best served by conserving various social institutions, systems, and philosophies. To be progressive is to believe that society is best served by changing various societal institutions, systems, and philosophies. As such, conservatism's virtue is dependent upon what? It is dependent upon what is being sought to be conserved. For example, this can either be good or bad. For example, in the antebellum South, in the lead up to the Civil War, someone would be rightly considered to be conservative in that context while trying to conserve the institution of slavery. Whereas, at the same time, in, uh, antebellum, in the antebellum North, the abolitionists uh, who were seeking to get rid of the institution of slavery would have been uh, rightly defined as being progressive in that context. Now, political parties will use these terms, con uh, conservative and progressive, to categorize their political philosophy, but generally they are not entirely consistent. Uh, the issues often are too nuanced and pundits more interested in self-preservation than something like ideological consistency. Uh, however, in American politics, let's look at how it kind of plays out. Those on the right tend to be animated by the idea that future prosperity will be found by getting back to a perceived past utopia, the idea of conserving something from our past. Think of the successful political campaign of Donald Trump that said, make America great again, looking to the past, looking to something in the past we want to conserve or get back to. Uh, whereas in America, on the left, uh, people on the left tend to be animated by the idea of future prosperity uh, being found and achieved, uh, achieving some kind of utopia or bliss in the future through change. Think of Obama's successful campaign slogan of hope and change. Didn't even define what the change was, just do you want change? Uh, more fundamentally, though, conservatives, as Al Albert Moeller puts it, believe that there are permanent truths. There are permanent virtues, there are permanent laws, permanent structures of existence that are absolutely necessary to have a flourishing society, to have any livable human order. And so these things might include things like reason, ontology, the family, biblical morality, freedom of expression, the list can go on, uh, but to be good, uh, conservatism, uh, this list must be somewhat diverse and nuanced. For instance, if you reduced conservatism, as often can be done in modern times, 
um, or in, in our modern American context, uh, conservatism can be reduced down to conserving something like political or, or personal liberty uh, without the other necessary structures of existence. If you do that, then you're not going to result, that's not going to result in uh, societal flourishing. You can't only conserve personal liberty. Otherwise, people just do what they want, and that's all we get. Now, personal liberty is a necessary thing to conserve, but it's not the only thing that must be conserved. In the best sense, conservatives seek to conserve all of these things, these, these uh, um, as Mueller puts it, these permanent truths for the good of society. Whereas progressives see society as systemically broken and only change will bring about a flourishing society. Now, some change is good, but not all change is good. And a permanent revolution, as those often on the left, uh, well, on the left have termed, is untenable for a flourishing society. You can't just have change for the sake of change. You can't just have a permanent revolution. There's things that ought to be changed. But if your modus operandi is just change for the sake of change, you're going to end up changing things that should not be changed, and it ends up hurting society. An example of that is the moral revolution that we're experiencing in the West. Uh, that's an example of the kind of change we don't need to have a flourishing society. So should the Christian be conservative or progressive? Theologically and morally, the Christian should always be conservative. Changing biblical doctrine to fit the times or to keep up uh, with the more revolution, to remain relevant, is never okay for the Christian. No matter how strong the societal pressures get, the biblical truth is that God created man and woman, not prostate havers and pregnant persons. Jesus makes it very clear in Scripture that marriage is between what? A man and a woman. No other variation is allowed. To believe anything else is to elevate culture's view or your own intuition above Holy Scripture, which is entirely untenable for the disciple of Jesus. And so morally and theologically, every Christian, true Christian, is conservative. Otherwise, you're following a different religion. You're following a different truth than the truth laid out in Holy Scripture. Now, what about matters of public policy? A little bit different. Related, but a little bit different. Well, it depends. The Christians should be conservative insofar as they seek to conserve public policy, which adheres to a biblical worldview, and progressive insofar as they seek to change public policy so that it begins to adhere to a biblical world view. This requires wisdom and thought. Again, where do we start off? One of the problems, right? This is an important question. Oftentimes we label ourselves as conservative or progressive without even thinking. But to be biblically consistent requires that we do some thinking, requires that we employ some wisdom. Uh, because there are some things that uh, public policy issues that I would describe or has been described, I didn't come up with the term, as straight line issues. There's a clear biblical command that is lined up with a clear public policy position. For example, abortion. There is no such thing as a pro-abortion Christian position. The Bible is very clear that all life is sacred and must be held so. And so the killing of an unborn child is never okay. Other issues, though, are not so straightforward. That's what's called jagged line issues. There's no clear biblical command on something, let's say. So you must bounce around between a host of biblical truths and employ wisdom where the rules don't seem to apply. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, tax policy. The only thing we know from Scripture is that we ought to pay our taxes, <laughs> as Jesus taught us, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. But what that tax policy looks like is there's no clear biblical command for that, and so we have to do some thinking and come to the, some conclusions based on what we perceive to be the uh, most consistent with biblical truth. And in doing all of this, the Christian must also recognize that no culture is perfect. Therefore, in every culture, there are going to be things that ought to be conserved and things that ought to change. We move into error when we only conserve or we only want change. We only conserve or we only change. That would be to be very culturally blind to the moment. 
In every culture, there's things that ought to stay the same and things that ought to change because this is not heaven on earth or this is not heaven, this is earth. And we're in the process of growing into seeing God's kingdom come more fully in our, in our context. And so biblically, we should do both. And the Christian, therefore, is not conservative or progressive. They are to be biblical. Biblical. Uh, this is an important distinction to make because if we see ourselves primarily as conservative or progressive in the political sense, uh, instead of biblical, we will be animated by the wrong impulse. Have you ever wondered uh, why it's about a 50-50 split in society between who's conservative and who's progressive? Have you ever thought, what, why is that? It's because temperamentally, people tend toward one or the other, and uh, there's uh, research available f- on this that I've read about, and it's really interesting. Uh, the underlying natural impulse for someone who would lean towards a conservative ideology is be that they kind of fear change. They don't. They, they fear change. They don't feel comfortable with change. They just want things to stay as they are. That uh, and if th- th- that what makes them feel that is what makes them feel comfortable. It's one of the reasons why people who tend to be conservative stay in small towns and rural areas where there's not so much change bumping up against you and and interruptions heading you from all sides like you would in an urban environment. And the underlying natural impulse of a progressive is dissatisfaction. They want change. Now, this is, there's more that could be said on this, but I think that's basically, basically true. And if we choose to be conservative or progressive based on this, our temperament, our natural inclination, it will not serve us or our world well. If these uh, impulses animate us in the decision-making process as we seek to uh, uh, walk and, and, be, and live in our world, uh, it, will, it, will not, it will not serve us well. The thing that will be cultivated in our heart will be anxiety, fear, and dissatisfaction, because that's the impulse we're giving into, and that's why we're seeking to be conservative or uh, progressive. If this happens, we will, um, it will be because we have forgotten, as Christians, who we are. As Christians, we must be motivated by a biblical mindset, not a partisan mindset. A partisan mindset is one that is latched onto an ideology or a team, and we're not thinking about what we're actually agreeing to. We're just making an intuitive decision, not a wise decision, not a biblical decision. And if we think through the lens of partisanship, we're going to end up being stuck, uh, because that's just the re- the reality of politics, stuck in a cycle of fear and alarm, constantly afraid that everything is about to fall apart. The typical partisan person will say that every election that's about ready to happen is the most important election of all time. Everything hinges in the balance of that one election. Now, every election matters and has consequences. But it's not the end-all or the be-all. But if we think partisanly, we'll always be stuck in that cycle of alarm, fear, anxiety. Jesus does not call us, politically speaking, to be conservative or progressive. He calls us what? To be salt and light. If we ourselves um, if we see ourselves as salt and light, then what will animate us? Not fear, anxiety, or alarm only. I mean, alarm is an appropriate uh, uh, thing to have. Concern is an appropriate thing to have. Certainly fear and anxiety should not motivate us. But if we see ourselves as salt and light, the thing that will animate us as Christians is hope. Because here's the fact. There is a day coming when the Democratic Party will be no more. There is a day coming when the Republican Party will be no more. There is a day coming when the United States of America will be no more. But what did Jesus say of his church? He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, this does not mean that we disengage from politics, but it does mean that we engage with a biblical worldview, not a partisan worldview. And the hope for our nation is not the conservative agenda or the progressive agenda. It is Christians living out their role as being salt, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so what is the conclusion? We be who Jesus called us to be. We are to be salt and light. And we do that through evangelism, through spiritual formation, through voting with a biblical worldview, through participating in politics as salt and light, through local and foreign missions, through prayer, through serving at the local church, 
And so my encouragement is this. Be salt and light for the glory of God. Don't lose your saltiness by doing what is politically expedient, but is morally wrong. Don't hide your light under a basket by avoiding the conversation, but engaging in our culture by reflecting the glory of Christ everywhere we go. So as the Christian to be conservative or progressive, we're called to be biblical. And so we'll either be technically conservative or progressive, depending on what needs to be done to adhere to a biblical worldview, to honor Christ in all that we do. Amen? Until next time, have a blessed day.